Hello, friends, and welcome to Praying for America. I'm pro-life leader Frank Pavone, and I direct Priests for Life, one of the nation's largest pro-life groups. Welcome to the program. And we're going to talk about President Trump tonight and the 2024 race, a couple of observations that will be helpful, I'm sure. Let's begin, um, uh, though, with uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 6. It talks about the whole armor of God. He says, in starting in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand firm in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Let us pray. Father, we are rejoicing that you arm us with these gifts of the Spirit, the word of truth, grace of salvation, readiness to proclaim the gospel of peace. We give you thanks that we are able to use these spiritual tools in saving America, praying for America, building up America. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, and we ask that your people may ever be faithful to the gifts you have given us in this great spiritual battle. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in recent uh, programs, as you know, I've been looking at what is the spiritual battle that we're involved in, and I'm going to continue examining that uh, as we as we uh, uh, go on in our in our nightly programs, but I want to take a pause here and look at some of the latest uh, information on the 2024 race. Of we know, we know, of course, uh, uh, Senator Tim Scott has jumped into the race, and uh, we are expecting more announcements in the days and weeks to come uh, from other contenders for the Republican nomination. Uh, Tim Scott is, uh, as you know, the only. Uh, black Republican uh, member of the Senate from South Carolina. He uh, has um, said that he's jumping into this race because he sees the terrible destruction being done to America under the Democrats, under the Biden administration. Well, you know, that's something that motivates all of us, of course, to pray and work hard for America and for the things we believe in and for the freedoms that we have and to preserve those freedoms for our our children and and their children as well. So it 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 is it is a it is a motivating factor that of course President Trump has spoken about all the time as well when he is asked how are you how how is it that while having to endure all of the the attacks and the, the fake investigations and the weaponization of government that is launched against you, that you know is is just even even though he's been out of out of office, they're still attacking him vigorously because they don't want him jumping back in, and he knows what they, what he will face upon entering a second term, and he says, "Well, the reason I'm doing this, same reason I." got into the race in the first place, was look what they're doing to the country. Friends, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a human response. This is not political garbage, you know, deception, beating around the bush, you know, all hot air like so many politicians are filled with. This is sincere human response to... The, de- the, the desecration, we should say, and destruction of a country that we love. And if you feel that you can do something about it, 
well, then you step up to the plate and you do it. And that's why President Trump is, is running. And this is what Tim Scott is referring to as well. And I would say all of those that are running on the Republican side are going to articulate this uh, this ongoing devastating damage that the Democrats are inflicting on us. I want to say something about this, uh, you know, uh, the CNN town hall that took place that we all saw recently with President Trump. Yeah, you know, it didn't go like uh, like the left uh, or those that CNN might have thought that it was going to go. I don't know what they were thinking. Uh, but uh, let's say this. They did the right thing by giving President Trump the opportunity to speak directly to the CNN audience. These are people who are part of our country. And they did the right thing in doing that. What was not right about it was that instead of letting President Trump simply talk to the audience and through them to the the wider audience of of, uh, uh, American uh, viewers, that it turns into a a debate with... uh, with the uh, with the interviewer there, uh, Caitlin uh, Collins, what what was that all about? Who who is she? To to and I, and she came off as such as a, trying to be such a know it all. Oh, I read the Presidential Records Act. Yeah, well, so did a lot of the rest of us. The point is, oh, who are you? You're you're talking with uh, you know with a, a former president of the United States here. He kind of knows what the the office entails. And she tried to 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 come off as such a know-it-all, um, really, really, uh, a really embarrassing situation uh, uh, for her. But President Trump did answer uh, the challenges, did answer the questions, and uh, and the analysis that was done afterwards. I want to comment on one of the uh, one of the uh, comments in the analysis that I saw. The left, of course, they don't know what they 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 don't know how to articulate truth. Their media outlets and their campaigns on the left are just filled with lies. The Democrats have become just outright evil as a party. It's really it's got to be voted uh, into political oblivion. But what they go ahead and say then is they criticize President Trump for continuing to talk about claims regarding the 2020 election. But here's the point. Watch that town hall again on CNN and look at what the first question was that the president was asked. It was about the 2020 election. How can you, on on the one hand, start the conversation by referring back to the 2020 elections and then complain that he keeps talking about the 2020 elections. How how is that supposed to work in any reasonable, sane world? This is because these people are insane. They 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 don't want to do anything except criticize President Trump. This is a driving force for them. Whatever is going to be bad for President Trump. The, the, these people are are just they're not out for the good of America. They don't care about you and me. They don't care about freedom. They care about anything they can do to destroy or criticize their political opponents, using also the weaponization of government, as we have seen more and more clearly uh, unfolding, both by the things coming out, the Durham report and the hearings in the House on the weaponization of government and uh, uh, all of these things coming out, and as we see ongoing in the continued fake investigations of President Trump. In regard to his claims about the 2020 elections, one has to understand where he's coming from is, look, we just want honest and fair elections in America. And to have those going forward, we need to understand what has gone before. It's not about being stuck in the past. I'm sure that there are, I mean, I I hear it just as I'm sure you do. People who are saying, oh, well, we have to, to move on. Yeah, we have to move on in a way 
that strengthens the confidence of the American people that we have fair and free elections. That's how we have to move on. And all I'm saying is, if there are unanswered questions about anything in the past, well, let's answer them. That's all. Now, people will say, oh, well, you know, the courts threw out any kind of... uh, um, any kind of cases, you know, in regard to, to the election. Well, be careful that you understand what actually did and didn't happen. There's a difference between a court analyzing the arguments and ruling on the merit of the arguments one way or the other versus deciding that they're not going to hear the arguments based on procedural grounds, lack of standing, lack of ripeness, mootness. There's all kinds of reasons why a court might not take a particular case. Well, if a court doesn't take a particular case, then that means the question is still open. It can be judged at a future time. It's not bound by something called res judicata, which means if a matter is examined and decided by a court, then those people cannot then come before the court, unless you're talking about an appeal or some motion is granted to, to rehear the case. But res judicata means, okay, this is something that's already been adjudicated, so you're not going to raise the same question again and ask us to adjudicate it all over again. But that's not that, 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 that wasn't the case. When you say, oh, all these different courts were, were uh, looking at these uh, arguments. Well, before you say that, see whether the court examined actually examined the arguments on their merits rather than saying you know what for one or another reason we're not going to hear this case in the first place along these lines by the way let me say something about the case of moore versus harper let me go to the board and uh and um I'll give you give some space here we are in a spiritual battle this is what we were talking about recently Uh, There's a Supreme Court case under consideration right now, and we've talked about it in some past programs, coming uh, out of North Carolina. In dealing with the elections, the outcome of this uh, can have, um, and we're coming to the end of the Supreme Court's current term, of course. It ends at the end of of June. This can have a significant effect on the uh, on the 2024 elections, because it has to deal with the role of the state legislatures in elections. I'll give you a little bit bit of background. So we had the 2020 census, right? And once the census is taken every 10 years, based on the changes in population, the districts get redefined. So the, uh, and, 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 and the boundaries, you know, a state might gain more congressional districts or lose some. Uh, And then you have redistricting on the state level as well. And, and in different states, these lines, these new boundaries based on changing populations are determined in in different ways. And in North Carolina, what happened was that the state legislature drew up a new map, okay, as it was supposed to do, drew up a new map, but then it was challenged by the Democrats. And the North Carolina Supreme Court threw it out, threw out the map. And said, no, sorry, guys, you got to redo it. Now, what's at issue? Why did it go all the way up to the Supreme Court? Because there's a constitutional issue here. The Constitution of the United States says that the manner in which elections are conducted in a state, including elections for federal office, are determined by this by the state legislature. It doesn't say that they are determined by the courts. It doesn't say that they're determined by 
the commissioner of, of the secretary of state or commissioner of elections or it's the legislature. Okay, so that's what's at issue here. Did the Supreme Court in North Carolina overstep its boundaries by throwing out the map for redistricting in North Carolina that the legislature, consistent with its duties under the Constitution, drew up? So the court accepted this case. Now, the interesting thing that has happened since then is there was the election, the midterm elections of 2022. And as a result of those elections, the composition of the North Carolina Supreme Court changed. And the Supreme Court, in North Carolina that is, reversed its decision and said, we don't have the authority to review the map, much less throw it out. We don't have the authority. We made a, The court made a mistake. So now the question is, should the Supreme Court continue deciding this case? I am of the conviction that, yes, it should. And the opinion is divided about this because some are saying, okay, well, because the thing that brought up the dispute in the first place has now reversed itself, uh, the uh, case is moot, the, the court doesn't have to continue uh, to decide it, but you can easily see this same issue coming before the Supreme Court again, right? Because it's the question of how much authority does the state legislature have? Now, I think it's a pretty clear, clearly answered question already because the Constitution says it. We're not trying to draw implications from the Constitution. We're not trying to read in interpretations of the Constitution. The Constitution clearly says that the way con elections are conducted in a particular state is up to the state legislature. So it's like, I don't know why, it, 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 you know, that's not clear enough. But the fact of the matter is, it is still a valid and important question for the court, the high court, to clarify. Because when you have the authority and the boundaries of that authority clearly reinforced by a court decision, that is simply reinforcing the words that are in the Constitution, then it's going to be much more difficult for some uh, Secretary of State to give an order to the various uh, boards of uh, elections in a state not to follow the laws that the state legislature enacted about whether or not, for example, you can accept a ballot without a signature or whether you can accept a ballot after the deadline that the state legislature set for when ballots can be received, and on and on with all sorts of other things, which we saw, and this goes back again to the 2020 um, election, we saw a lot of instances in which the provisions of the state legislatures weren't followed. And so it's like, okay, there's a, there's a valid constitutional question here that does need to be both raised and answered. Let me go back to the chair. The, um, the point here, brothers and sisters, is, you know, it, it, it really is laughable uh, how this um, constant criticism of President Trump uh, continues when, I mean, if you, if you, <laughs> that, that, that town hall with CNN, if you don't want him talking about something, don't ask him about it. Oh, I want to, we should be talking about 2024. We should be talking about our future issues. Well, then why in the world don't you ask him a question about 2024 and future issues? Which the left is just, they're just... Speaking of his, his position on future issues, by the way, before we go back into prayer, let me show you uh, the webpage, donaldjtrump.com. I hope you go to this webpage regularly because you'll see there um, important updates from him. Let's take a look at the page. And up at the top, you will see um, the Agenda 47. Okay, let's click on that. 
and scroll down and you'll see that this is a series of videos that the president has been putting out, Agenda 47, on various different topics. Uh, the first one you see there as posted today, uh, protecting students uh, from the radical left, Marxist maniacs infecting educational institutions. These are short videos giving his policy uh, proposals on a wide range of issues of importance to Americans. Uh, Agenda 47, ending the nightmare of the homeless drug addicts and dangerously deranged. Um, uh, a third one, liberating America from Biden's regulatory onslaught. I want to invite you to keep tuned into that page. So it's donaldjtrump.com. And again, you see it at the top among the various links, Agenda 47. Keep attuned to that page. And as these videos come out, where President Trump is speaking about specific policy issues and proposals and things he would do if he's back in the White House, watch them and then start conversations about them and uh, share them with others. We're going to talk more about this again tomorrow and delve into this a little bit more deeply because I'm going to share with you some additional things that uh, impact um Oh, I want to share with you some new new polling that has come out about the way people view President Trump. But we'll do that tomorrow uh, as we're running out of time here tonight. But do check out that web page. Let's pray. Father, thank you for America. Thank you for the opportunity to pray for, work for, speak for, and defend America. And may your people be, be emboldened to do so continuously and strongly. And we pray in the words Jesus gave us, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, connect with me on social media. I'm at Fr Frank Pavone and spread the word about our programs. We have a lot more to talk about, and I thank you for being with us. Talk to you tomorrow. Hi, I'm Dr. Teresa Burke, founder of Rachel's Vineyard and pastoral associate of Priest for Life. In my decades of work with parents and families who have lost a child to abortion, I have found that for some, the journey of healing includes sharing their story publicly. Such individuals carefully discern this option after having told the people closest to them about their experience. Since 2002, Priests for Life and Anglicans for Life have conducted the Silent No More Awareness Campaign, which helps such people to share their abortion story so that others might avoid abortion, and those who are suffering from it may know that hope and healing are available. To find out more about this ministry and to read testimonies of these brave men and women, visit silentnomore.com. Hello, this is Father David Begany, one of the many members of Priests for Life. This organization is one of the largest and most visible pro-life ministries in the world. Priest, the Priests for Life team relies on your financial support to be able to do its work, produce its programs, and travel the world to advocate for the unborn. May I ask you to support Priests for Life generously? Go today to prolifegift.org and give us as generous a gift as you can. Thank you for your kindness and be assured of our prayers for you every day. Priests for Life, saving lives for over 30 years.